This is Selma Schimmel in Chicago at the annual ASCO meeting for the group room. And we're going to shift our discussion now to gynecologic cancers as we welcome Dr. Professor Lynette Denny, head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Cape Town. And Dr. Denny is also president-elect of the International Gynecologic Cancer Society. Welcome to the group room. Thank you. Very pleased to talk to you because the gynecologic cancers are challenging, really scary, and uh, in particular ovarian cancer, where we're beginning to see some, some traction and new possibilities. And let's talk with you about what's been happening at this meeting and what is the information we want to share with our viewers about progress, not just in ovarian cancer, but the other gynecologic cancers too. Interestingly, as you know, I come from Africa where the distribution of gynecological cancers is different. So most of the gynecological cancers are from the lower genital tract in women in Africa, whereas in northern countries it's from the upper genital tract. So the cancers you're dealing with in this part of the world are ovarian, fallopian tube, and uterine cancers. And I think that you know for a long time we've been battling to make big advances in the treatment of ovarian cancer. And to this point we still haven't found the, we haven't found the cure. So some women at the time of diagnosis, we, we do manage to, if it's early enough, we do manage to cure with a combination of surgery and standard chemotherapy. But the problem is high recurrence rates, and then what do you use after that? And I think modern, the modern advances in terms of chemotherapeutic agents has enabled us to think of ovarian cancer as a chronic disease. In other words, women live longer, however they have to go through multiple courses or cycles of chemotherapy, which has a major impact on not just quality of life, but um, quantity of life to a certain extent. Um, I think the new targeted therapies and the anti-angiogenesis um, therapies are showing a lot of promise. Um, we in oncology tend to talk about months of increased survival. I think for a patient you want to talk about years, if not uh, clumps of years of, of, of improved quality of life or length of life. So we're still battling and I think we're battling with the old principle of cancer which is cut it out, burn it out or poison it out. And I think in the future we're going to be talking much more about identifying the genetic abnormalities and changing those genetic abnormalities and how they express themselves. Were there any particular uh, presentations or studies that were presented here for uh, new treatments that impressed you? I was very impressed with all the anti-angiogenesis -anti -anti data. That was, I thought, excellent. I thought the keynote lecture by the winner of the award um, Professor Jane, I think, um, on the state of the art. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. What were some of the points of that lecture? Well, he, he talked about normalizing tumor environment, and he had this cartoon of a blood vessel, and a lymphatic vessel, a cancer cell, a matrix, immunological cells, and he, he, he talked about how each component of that becomes abnormal. In, in a malignancy, whichever malignancy it is, and how there are now targeted therapies to each one of those areas of abnormality. And I found that very interesting because um, if you go to the alternative Eastern type healthcare, they talk about, for example, improving the oxygenation of the body to fight disease, and that's a major part of what they're doing in these scientific laboratories. They also talk about improving the ability of the lymphatic channels to remove the waste that is generated by cellular activity. So there's this fascinating to me um, um, juxtaposition mm -hmm. of this really hard basic science and old Eastern philosophies. <laughs> and to me, that, that always signals truth. There's a kind of, you know, when these things marry. Um, I mean, I obviously practice very conventional medicine, but I'm interested 
that for 5,000 or 10,000 years, people in the East have practiced medicine and saved you know, people's lives and, and healed people. So I, I find it very exciting when you have these different, totally different conceptual ways of thinking, in fact, being joined together. I thought that lecture was outstanding. What about the area of cervical cancer? Hmm. There was very little on cervical cancer in this conference, a couple of posters. Um, no keynotes, no plenaries. So the emphasis of the gynecologic cancer presentations were on ovarian cancer? Ovary, fallopian tube, uterine, very little on cervix, very little even on the greatest innovation I think that's happened in, in science for a long time is the human papillomavirus vaccination. And there was really not that much on that. Um, interesting to me because it's just such an amazing innovation. Perhaps now it's maybe because they're already starting so widely to vaccinate that... Although they're doing very badly in the U.S., you know, only something like 30 percent of girls who get vaccinated have their third vaccine. Um, if you do a similar thing in, in South Africa, 98 percent get all their three vaccines. But we only do it in, in research settings. So cervix cancer, is not a, it's not a big deal. I think there are only 14,000 cases a year in the U.S. Um, in a population of, what, 350 million. So it's not a common cancer because you screen. So it's not a big issue in, in first world countries. Um, but it's a major, major issue in our country. And what about uterine cancer? Uterine cancer, there was a lot. Um, nothing really dramatically... Um, new, um, except I think what's come back with uterine cancer is using chemotherapy in an adjunctive setting. Some people are even using it prior to surgery. So for a long time, chemotherapy was out and not used in uterine therapy. It's now come back into vogue. And there is data to suggest, particularly with advanced disease, that it does have a reasonable impact. But I think also what's important in uterine cancer is again it's going to be genotyping. And that this concept of well you've got a uterus, you've got a cancer, one size fits all. It's, it, those days are over. And different cancers have different genetic abnormalities and mutations and therefore will respond differently to treatment. And I think that's starting to happen in uterine cancer. Where do you see the future of PARP inhibitors? I think PARP inhibitors are very exciting. I think that, um, I think all these, you know, the alpha folate receptor antagonists, I think the PARP inhibitors have a huge role, probably as adjuvant rather than as primary therapy, uh, which makes sense because you, you're attacking the disease from different angles. Mm -hmm. I think it's very exciting. And for me, coming from Africa, the most exciting thing about ASCO has been being able to get access to these studies um, before they're published in the international literature and to see what's happening. And the trends are very exciting. Well, do you have some closing thoughts as to where you see the future going or what a takeaway message for you is as you go back home to South Africa? My strongest feeling around cancer is that we must never forget that it is a disease of human beings. And as we design our treatments, our science, our interventions, never to forget that it's a human being who's going to come out at the other end of it. And I look at some of these trials and I just don't know how women put themselves through it, or men. I think that we need to stay very, very close to our humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Lynette Denny head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, president-elect of the International Gynecologic Cancer Society. Thank you.